Thanks for taking the time to view this video where I discuss uh, and analyze the various income driven repayment programs, IBR income based repayment, uh, pay, pay as you earn versus repay, um, re revised pay as you earn, uh, with a specific audience in mind, that being uh, medical students, medical students who are uh, close to graduating and um, moving into residency programs. Uh, so uh, with that said, just a quick attempt at humor with that comic there. Uh, at the rate I'm going, my student loans should be paid off in, in three years. Uh, response is, that's great, Dad. I think we just moved into a kind of a different paradigm uh, with respect to uh, student loans where you know some of us are carrying this type of debt um, close to retirement so uh, unfortunately we're just having to deal with this issue some contact information um, so if you have any questions or concerns feel free to reach out to me uh, I do provide uh, tax advisement services as well as retirement uh, planning services so if you have questions uh, as, as well as uh, you know loan repayment uh, strategy development so if you have questions or concerns feel free to reach out to me and I'll respond as quickly as possible I think uh, the the initial discussion should be kind of a general overview of the three income driven repayment programs uh, that are available to most students uh, so the top area here kind of goes over the uh, terms of the program so let me address income-based repayment or IBR uh, first. Uh, the payment is based on 15% of discretionary income uh, on an annual basis. Then you divide by 12 to arrive at a monthly payment. Uh, discretionary income is defined as your adjusted gross income from the prior year minus a uh, poverty income uh, level. The poverty income level is determined by the federal government uh, using uh, your number of family members as well as your state of residence. Um, so just kind of a general rule of thumb for me is that for income-based repayment, it's about 13% of your adjusted gross income. So if you're making $100,000, then your annual payments would be about 13% um, of that or $13,000 divided by 12 to arrive at. Um, your monthly payment. Uh, another benefit for I IBR is that there is a cap placed so if your income increases your payments will never exceed 10 percent excuse me uh, never exceed the 10-year standard payment amount. Uh, so a nice uh, provision within IBR. Um, one of the concerns though with IBR is it's, the, it's a 25-year repayment period and if you have any uh, remaining balance at 25 years, that balance is forgiven, but uh, any forgiveness experienced to realize is considered taxable income, fondly known as the tax bomb. Another concern that you should be aware of is that if you no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship, meaning that your income increases to the point that your payments are now equal to the standard 10 year payment amount, then any interest um, is capitalized at that point or if you opt out of IVR then that interest is capitalized as well. Uh, the point to the income level at which you would no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship in IVR specifically is about a one-to-one -one ratio with your student loans as you entered a repayment. So if you entered repayment at about $300,000 of student loans, then your adjusted gross income would have to be about $300,000 in order to no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship. Um, so it's a fairly high level, but it is a concern for uh, a lot of you who are in high paid specialties. Uh, so just be aware of that. Uh, pay as you earn and repay with respect to the monthly payment. Uh, it's 10% of discretionary income, uh, so it's a third less than IBR. So for most 
residents, I wouldn't recommend that you even consider IVR. It's either pay or, or repay. Uh, with pay, there is a uh, cap at no more than the 10-year standard monthly payment amount. So if and when your income increases dramatically, moving from residency to an attendee, uh, then pay has that 10-year cap. Unfortunately, repay does not. Uh, so your your payments would all be if you remain in repay would always would always be uh, a percentage of your income uh, with no payment cap. So that could be a concern. Uh, but just focusing on pay, uh, it is a twenty year repayment period. Um, if at the end of twenty years there there is any remaining balance, uh, that balance is forgiven but it is taxable income to you. Um, should you no longer demonstrate a, a partial financial hardship or opt out of pay, then the accrued interest is capitalized to that uh, balance and then you're responsible for uh, the accrued interest. Um, so just be concerned that that, you know, that, there, that, that is a possibility that the uh, interest is capitalized once you no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship or you opt out. Uh, one of the benefits with pay and repay is that your income level, in order for you to no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship, is about one and a half times um, the amount of your student loans once you enter repay, or pay for that matter. Uh, so if you had $300,000, of student loans once you enter uh, repayment, then the income level for you to no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship with uh, pay as you earn would be uh, about $450,000 of adjusted gross income. So that threshold is higher than IBR. So moving on to repay, the real benefit with repay is that second bullet point. Uh, with respect to uh, medical students going into residency in that it provides a 50% interest subsidy on any month-to-month -month negative amortization uh, or what you're not paying in the interest due. So as mentioned there, it's a critical feature in determining which is better for you, either pay or repay. Uh, and that's what, you know, in the next series of slides, um, I'll discuss that in more detail. Um, the concern, though, is that if you do have a spouse, regardless of filing status, so if you decide to file jointly or you decide to file separately, the spouse's income will always be considered uh, in determining uh, the borrower's payments under repay. So if your spouse has income and student federal student loans, um, then that might not be much of an issue. It may be, in fact, better for you, for both the, for both spouses to be in repay. But if your spouse has significant income but no student loans, uh, that's adversely going to affect uh, your repay payments. It may be better in those specific situations um, that you uh, stay in pay uh, so that you can file separately and exclude your spouse's income uh, from uh, the pay calculation. Um, but with repay, uh, that program only became available in uh, December of 2015. Uh, Congress understood what uh, individuals or, or married couples were doing um, in pay in that they were filing separately to exclude the spouse's income. That loophole was kind of addressed and closed with repay, again, regardless of how you file, the spouse's income will always be used uh, to determine uh, your monthly payment. The other concern is that uh, with repay, you have a 25-year repayment period. This may not be an issue for residents because at the end of residency and as you enter um, as an attending, you may not even want to be in an income-driven repayment program. Uh, you might want to 
uh, either accelerate payment within the federal repayment options or you might want to refinance your loans uh, through private lenders such as SOFI, DRB, or First Republic in order to capture a lower rate and accelerate your, your payment period. Um, but again, uh, that's something I'll address in just a second. The other thing that you should be aware of um, with repay, only direct loans are, are, are eligible for this repayment option. So make certain that you check nslds.ed.gov to see what type of loans that you have outstanding. Uh, again, here, these are the participation requirements at the bottom of this table. Uh, so some of you may have taken out federal loans on or before October 1st of 2007 as you started undergrad. And as such, you may not be eligible to participate in pay. Uh, that criteria doesn't apply with repay. It's just a matter of, of the loan type. If all your loans are direct loans, uh, then they're eligible for repay. One strategy is if you do have a, a combination of direct or FELL loans or Perkins loans and possibly HPSL or LBS, you can consolidate through uh, studentloans.gov to convert them into direct loans, uh, therefore eligible for repay. But I'll get into that in, uh, in uh, just a second. What I'd like to do is to go over some uh, of the spreadsheets to give you a better sense uh, of what your options are. Uh, so given the assumption that you've taken out $300,000 uh, at an interest rate of 6.5%, that would produce a 10-year standard monthly payment amount of about $3,400. Um, just to give you kind of a, a, of a uh, reference point. Uh, with these income-driven repayment programs, what I would suggest that you do, and I'll go over this in just a second as well, is that immediately after you've completed um, medical school and before you start your residency, uh, you would want to consolidate your loans in an attempt to enter the income driven repayment programs uh, immediately after graduating medical school and before starting your residency. And in doing so, you can, you can waive your grace period and that's what I would recommend that you do in order to enter these income driven repayment programs as soon as possible. Under that assumption, uh, what will happen is that they'll look back at your prior year. So they'll look at MS3 year in order to determine what your income was for that, uh, that year. So the assumption is that your income is zero. That would produce um, a first year payment. Uh, so from, say you apply... You graduate in May, uh, you apply uh, for uh, consolidation at the end of May. Uh, it takes about four to six weeks for the process to complete. So let's say on July 1st, the process is complete, but because you had a prior year income of zero for the period July 1st through June 30th of the next year, or really your first year of residency, your payments are going to be zero, uh, uh, as demonstrated by this first line here, by this first row. Uh, but because you're considering pay, uh, you got to be concerned with the annual uh, negative amortization, uh, and that's the amount that you're underpaying in interest. Uh, so for this first year, the negative amortization amount is $19,500. Um, this unpaid interest is a cumulative amount. Uh, so for this first year, you've underpaid the interest by $19,500. You've not touched the principal. So from the loan servicer's perspective, the principal and the interest after your first year is uh, $319,500. So for the second year, 
they'll look at your income from your first half year of residency. So you started your residency July 1st uh, through December 31st of that year. So you, you had about an AGI of $25,000. Um, that'll produce uh, a payment for your second cycle of, of the income driven repayment option of about $55. Uh, again, the concern with pay as you earn is that you're underpaying the interest uh, for that second year. You've underpaid the interest by $18,835. So in the course of two years, you've underpaid the interest by about $38,000. So from a lender's perspective, and excuse me, the loan servicer's perspective, your outstanding principal and interest is now uh, $338,000. So over the course of two years, you've only made you know student loan payments of six hundred and sixty-five dollars, rel relatively insignificant. I'm assuming that uh, you're in a five-year residency program, uh, so the fifth year of this program, um, your adjusted gross income is about fifty-four thousand uh, dollars. You're making payments of about two hundred eighty-three dollars per month at that point. You're, under, you're underpaying the interest by 16105 for that year. So over the course of five years, you've underpaid the interest by about $87,000 if you selected uh, pay as you earn. Uh, so your outstanding principal balance and the interest is now $387,000. Uh, so for that particular year, you made payments of about $3,400. One thing you should note is that the unpaid interest is not being capitalized to the principal. Uh, so that's a nice feature of these income driven repayment programs. Unless you hit one of the trigger points, uh, one of them being that your income has risen so high that you no longer demonstrate a partial financial hardship, or if you um, opt out of the income driven repayment programs, the interest is simple interest, so the interest is not capitalized. You're not um, being charged interest on interest. So here, what I'm assuming is that for the first half of the year, you're completing your residency. You complete your residency on, say, June 30th. And then on July 1st, you're an attending. So you have a half year income as a resident. Uh, then the remaining half year as an attending, that produces an AGI of $180,000 uh, and a monthly payment of $1,300 a month. You're, you're still accruing interest. Uh, at, for this particular year, it's about $3,500. So after six years of, of being in the, um, and as being in pay as you earn, excuse me, you have accrued interest of about uh, $91,000. So you have a standing balance of about uh, $391,000. At this point, what I would suggest, well, let me, let me do, draw a comparison. Um, so keeping this in mind um, that you've accrued about $91,000 if you had selected uh, pay as you earn after you know six years of being in that repayment program as compared to pay as uh, repay so some of the same numbers um, adjusted gross income for that first year is zero producing a monthly payment of zero you would have accrued interest or negative am of nineteen thousand five hundred but because you get that fifty percent interest subsidy then you're only responsible for $9,750. So you benefited by selecting repay uh, as compared to pay uh, of a subsidy of $9,750. Um, so you can see how this moves forward through um, you know, the first four years. Uh, you're accruing half the interest that you would otherwise accrued uh, had you selected um, pay. Uh, so the benefit to you, so if you stay through um, the end of your residency in the first year uh, of 
let's see, the first half year of attending, uh, then you would have saved about thirty-four thousand dollars by selecting WePay versus um, Pay as You Earn. So I would strongly recommend for most individuals, you know, if you're single, have no dependents, um, you're entering residency, there's really no discussion as to which one is a, re a better repayment option, uh, pay or repay. It's repay because of that 50% interest subsidy. Uh, this analysis becomes complicated only if you're married, uh, your spouse has income, and your spouse does not have student loans. Now, if your spouse does have income, but a rather significant amount of, of federal student loans, then you might both be better off in repay. Uh, but in most situations, I would imagine you're not married. Um, so, you know, revised pays your is the option that you would want to uh, consider. Then at this point, once you, you know, are an attending, it's, it's a decision as to whether or not you want to remain in the federal income driven repayment programs. Um, so what you could do is if you wanted to stay in, um, the federal income driven repayment programs, you might want to opt out of pay and into, uh, excuse me, opt out of repay and move back to pay as you earn because at some point your payments are going to probably exceed um, the the cap on this um, but that's something to consider the other consideration is whether or not uh, you want to refinance uh, to private commercial lenders uh, and try to get a lower rate than your current federal loan uh, rates. The assumption is, is that, you know, five or six years out, uh, that the rates are still competitive. Uh, my expectation is that no, potentially that might not be the case. It is uh, that uh, the underlying rates on these loans are going to move forward or increase over the course of the next uh, several years. So that by the time you're an attending, um, the private commercial lenders might have interest rates uh, that are essentially equal to uh, the federal uh, loan program. So that may not be a consideration uh, once you approach that point, but uh, obviously something to consider. Uh, you know, so, you know, for most residents, I would strongly suggest that you uh, select repay as your repayment option. So, just to give you kind of a summary as to uh, what, how you would approach this is that immediately after medical school uh, graduation, before you start residency, you should consolidate your loans at studentloans.gov. And in this process, they'll ask you whether or not you want to delay uh, the application uh, until after your grace period. Uh, I would suggest no, you do not want to delay. You want them to uh, immediately uh, complete the consolidation application in order for you to benefit from the 50% interest subsidy available in repay. Uh, there's no reason to delay uh, the process. You want to benefit from that 50% uh, interest subsidy uh, as soon as possible. Then going forward, you're just required to annually recertify your uh, federal income driven repayment plan uh, based on your anniversary date of when you originally applied for the income driven repayment program. So your loan servicer will send you emails two to three months in advance of when you need to recertify. Uh, so if uh, you originally went into the income driven repayment program, say July 1st, uh, they'll begin to contact you probably in May, maybe April, to let you know that you have to recertify uh, your income-driven repayment plan. Uh, it should be a, a 
fairly quick process available all online uh, so it, it shouldn't be too difficult uh, then you need to reevaluate excuse me reevaluate your repayment strategy once you move from uh, a resident to an attendee uh, it you know it may not be in your best interest to remain in the um, income driven repayment programs uh, given the fact that your income is going to increase dramatically uh, so you could switch to another uh, repayment option within the the federal repayment programs or you could consider refinancing uh, through a private commercial lender uh, some of those are listed there Sophie DBR DRB excuse me Ernest First Republic again uh, what you want to evaluate at that point is what the underlying interest rate you know, rates are uh, so it may be you know three or four or five years into the future those rates aren't as competitive as they are now uh, so just a couple of ideas to consider uh, if you do have questions or concerns feel free to reach out to me uh, drop me an email give me a call and I'll be more than happy to address your questions thanks and have a great day bye-bye